So um, I draw the information that I'll be presenting and sharing with you today from um, interviewing over 200 uh, individuals, both men and women, um, and uh, primarily, of course, in uh, Alberta, but I'm using also information from uh, printed uh, research in uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, also using various uh, publications that uh, focused on uh, that group of people and the uh, time period, uh, the late uh, 1890s uh, into the early 1930s. Uh, so um, the um, information again is a composite matter of speaking. The um, I would highly encourage you, if you haven't yet had a chance to, is to go to the Ukrainian a Cultural Heritage Village, because then you will actually see a lot of the information I share with you in a real perspective. Uh, the, um, the staff there are um, sort of uh, reenacting the time period. So when you talk to them, they'll talk to you as if you were a visitor uh, to their homes or, or uh, other sort of uh, facilities. And um, this uh, and and the time period that I will reflect on today was going to be the time period that they're uh, dealing with as well. So today I'm going to look at uh, the uh, following sort of outline. First of all, I'll start with a bit of background with the uh, old country, the Ukraine that the immigration immigrants uh, came from. Then the early sort of immigrant uh, uh, period um, homesteading here in uh, uh, Canada. Then I'm going to look at the uh, local uh, and uh, native uh, plants that they would have used as food supplements. Then I will look at the garden features, um, garden uh, crops that they grew, um, the gardening sort of uh, practices that they used in growing them, and then how they harvested and uh, uh, used the uh, plants. Uh, if I have time, I will uh, also include some consideration of uh, herbs and uh, flowers, but if not, then I'll have to just leave that uh, portion out and maybe make a, a short reference uh, to it. Now, the, the uh, pioneers that, um, or the, yeah, the pioneers, the settlers that came here to Canada uh, were from the uh, um, territories of Galicia, uh, also known as Holocena and Bukovina in uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So the thing to remember is that they were not refugees, but in a sense, they were invited guests. And I'll come down to that in a little later on. Now, their um, Galicia and Bukovina were basically um, a, a sort of a forested uh, steppe or grassland landscape, uh, rich in soils, uh, humid continental climate with warm, hot summers and uh, cold uh, winters, and even precipitation throughout the year. Um, the kind of climate that we, uh, conditions we find in uh, southern uh, BC, the Okanagan uh, area, and southern uh, Ontario. So again, you recognize that those are our fruit belts, in a matter of speaking, in uh, Canada. Now, serfdom in the Austro-Hungarian Empire was um, um, abolished in 1848, or uh, 41, pardon me. So then the uh, peasants who were formerly serfs had the ability to have their own sort of lands. But the trouble was that the um, uh, nobility in giving up serfdom uh, actually uh, gained uh, the control of a lot of the uh, agricultural lands, forests, meadows, and so forth. And so therefore the serfs were no longer um, directly obligated to them, but were financially obligated to them if they wished to use those lands, those forests, those uh, the uh, pastures and so forth. So again, there was servitude of a, of a different uh, nature. And uh, the agriculture that, uh, or the, they could actually work for the uh, lords as well, the, the impoverished ones who would not have any land holdings themselves. Uh, the um, the uh, agriculture that was practiced by, and I'll use the word peasants. And when I used this word before, in a presentation in Calgary, this woman came up and just totally berated me and said, how dare you call my grandparents peasants and on and on and on. I said, excuse me, a peasant was somebody who loved their land and knew how to, uh, to uh, work it, how to uh, uh, get its uh, uh, 
value out of it, etc. And then she quietened down and she re recognized that I was being very respectful of the word peasant, although we look upon peasant as an uneducated sort of uh, primitive type of, of, uh, of individual, which they were not. I mean, uh, they were poorly educated, but they knew how to use their land. And I'll probably come back to that a little bit uh, a little later on. So it was a semi-subsistence type of, uh, of agriculture that basically met the family's needs. And if there was anything left over, they could trade or sell it, etc. So the peasant-based farming uh, or uh, practices they had were basically a primitive, meaning old style, um, traditionally passed on from generation to generation and were non-technological. They didn't have all kinds of mechanical equipment, hoes, uh, spades, um, and so forth were used. And uh, so uh, they accomplished their tasks, but with a lot of hard labor involved in it. Um, so the farming was, again, mixed farming. Uh, they had uh, grain crops, they had uh, uh, extensive vegetables and uh, actually small orchards uh, were common uh, with uh, pears, plums, cherries and uh, apples, etc. So you can see that they had an abundance and diversity of uh, foods. Um, they of course function in a village context and uh, the, uh, the, the households were in the village, the homes were in the village in the yards, but the land itself that they uh, farmed were in uh, sort of uh, small strips and, and, and pieces outside of the village. So there's a disconnect then between the home itself and uh, where the farming was actually done. All members of the family contributed to the uh, sort of um, operation of the farm. So uh, certainly the women, um, had to do a lot of different things. The men would typically work in the fields and with uh, the large animals, but nevertheless, uh, father, mother, children were all involved as uh, was uh, needed. Now, at the time, it was suggested that um, a um, farm of about uh, 12 hectares, which is about 30 acres, was enough to uh, provide a family's needs. Tragically, the average farm, um, at that time was about three to five hectares or seven and a half to 12 acres. So you can see much smaller than what was uh, required to have a, a sort of uh, adequate uh, um, agricultural productivity and food supply. And uh, so therefore there were all kinds of, of potential issues with not having enough land, having to work off the land in the Lord's fields, et cetera, to make uh, money to buy whatever they uh, needed. And um, also uh, the fact that as their children married, they often gave them pieces of land to start their own sort of uh, homes. So that was a kind of diminishing sort of uh, holding for the uh, parents in time. And needless to say, uh, there was a, a sort of a desperate uh, need to, uh, to either be able to buy more land or have to sort of uh, face the reality of working for somebody else. And needless to say, the uh, Lords did not pay much. So as an example, my mother uh, described how as a young teenager, she had to work two days um, uh, from sun up to sunset to buy a kerchief, which cost about 50 cents at the time. So uh, it was not an easy life by any means. Um, and uh, the uh, style of uh, farming also uh, created sort of a um, um, low productivity so that they just had basically enough to meet their particular needs. Uh, uh, Canada, in the late 1800s was opening up its west. Uh, there was a problem in the sense of uh, being concerned that the west was not adequately uh, sort of um, uh, covered by, by uh, sort of Canadian people living in it and the Americans might take it over, etc. So the Canadian government uh, made a ter tremendous offer to uh, not only the Eastern Europeans, but uh, throughout uh, Northern Europe, Western Europe, and so forth. And uh, they allow, uh, suggested that they would allow uh, immigrants to obtain 160 acres. Yes, okay, so they would get 160 acres for $10. And that's, you know, uh, Canadian money. 
and uh, Sifton, who was the uh, Minister of the Interior, uh, uh, had this quotation that he was looking for stalwart peasants in sheepskin coats born on the soil whose forefathers had been farmers for 10 generations, albeit under uh, serfdom, um, and with a stout wife and half a dozen children, these were the kind of quality immigrants he wanted. So remember, he was inviting them, he wasn't saying find refuge in Canada, although they were in a sense technically economic refugees, not political refugees. So that was the first wave and there were about 170,000 of them between um, the uh, late 1890s and prior to World War I and they were primarily farmers, large families, etc. So that was the uh, first wave. Uh, then I will also include, but not directly reference, the second wave, which came between the uh, two world wars. So there was a pause in immigration between the wars. And uh, those were technically political and economic refugees. So not only farmers, but also intellectuals and professionals, whatever else. And there was about 70,000. So within the first part of the sort of... Um, uh, 20th century, almost 250,000 immigrants of Ukrainian um, ancestry came to Canada to settle in uh, Western Canada, um, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and uh, Alberta. And uh, so now the, the uh, sort of focus is on what do they, were they looking for when they came here by ship and then were uh, taken by a train to Western Canada, they were a little horrified when they saw the uh, landscape, uh, the uh, sort of Canadian shield consisting of rocks, the uh, coniferous forests, etc., which they knew were not uh, agricultural land. But as soon as they hit uh, Manitoba, they saw the open prairies, which of course disturbed them because they did not have a sense of farming on treed or, uh, or uh, treeless uh, sort of landscape. They came from the forest step uh, background. Yet when they discovered that there was something called the Aspen uh, um, parkland uh, vegetation zone from Southern Manitoba through Saskatchewan and into central um, uh, Alberta, they were delighted because that was very much like the sort of homeland that they were sort of leaving. So basically then they would have uh, adequate soil. Now they're, they're the uh, sort of uh, soils in the sort of uh, Aspen parkland are more luvisolic, uh, sort of uh, the forest soils, but uh, still quite ad adequate for agriculture. They would have wood for firewood, for building, etc. And remember, they had to buy wood from the lords if they needed wood. So it wasn't readily available to them. They could also have uh, uh, the, the wood for firewood, uh, they could have ponds and, and uh, sloughs on their uh, land that they could then uh, use uh, to water their uh, animals, their um, large animals, as well as um, uh, getting grass for hay and for uh, thatching the roofs on their sort of log houses. And lastly, there was an abundance of wild foods, both plant and animal, fish, etc. So they really thought that this was a God-given gift for $10. And in fact, some of them thought it was too much land to uh, take on. So um, they were too, truly sort of delighted. Um, what they didn't realize were two things, that the climate in Canada is harsh. It's not cold, it's miserable, um, uh, heavy snowfalls, all of those things that they really didn't have to deal with in uh, in their uh, <clears throat> in the old country, and secondly, um, that uh, all of this land had to be cleared, i.e., the forest had to be cut down to create agricultural lands. Whereas in the uh, sort of um, prairie landscape, you basically sort of exposed the land and, and farmed it. So uh, that became a, a sort of a significant uh, problem. One of the uh, sort of uh, blessings that the Canadian government provided them was that they did not require them to um, integrate into Canadian society, which was hostile to them, by the way. So they were called all kinds of things and we don't want those you know, smelly 
uh, people around, whatever else, smelly in the sense of garlic uh, and so forth. And so they allowed them to establish what are called block settlements. And that allowed them to live with their own sort of ethnic group. And that was a uh, blessing in the sense that they could help each other. They, they knew what they, um, uh, the old traditions and, and practices and so forth. So they were there to help each other. And in many cases, they were members, family members, or uh, sort of uh, old country neighbors or, or relatives, etc. So that there was a lot of sort of uh, potential support for them. Now, the government suggested that anybody coming over with the family needed at least $150. Now that they would have acquired either through selling their lands in the Ukraine, uh, in the old country, I'll just keep on using the word old country, or um, borrowing it from relatives, family, and so forth. But that was the basic requirement that would allow them to <clears throat> um, come to Canada to um, um, become somewhat established and to uh, sort of apply for the $10 sort of homestead. Uh, unfortunately, um, about 50% uh, of them only had about $150, i.e. the minimum, and another 42% of those newcomers had uh, about $500 or less. So you can see that again, financially, they were at a total disadvantage because to establish a farm during that time period in a relatively uh, short and easy time was um, required about a thousand to a thousand five hundred dollars. So needless to say, the Ukrainians were in for a hard time, but they had one thing going for them. They knew how to terpita, which in translation is how to suffer. They had suffered tremendously as under serfdom and so forth. They had suffered under these sort of uh, post serfdom conditions, whatever else. So that was really an advantage. And those of you who are Ukrainians really consider that to be something that you have up your sleeve whenever you need to use it. <clears throat> the, um, so the, the, the critical factors in, in uh, um, sort of developing the homestead once you applied for it uh, was that um, you uh, had to meet certain requirements. And those requirements were that you had to uh, live on the homestead for six months of the first three years. Now, why six months? Because they expected you to be working off the homestead for the remaining six months to earn further capital. You had to um, build a habitable house on it so that you could uh, live in it, of course. And you had to clear uh, over that time period at least uh, 30 acres or about 12 uh, hectares. So there was a catch. And uh, that part about having to work off the land, uh, off your homestead was significant, which quickly became obvious that the men would leave as soon as they could in the spring to work in um, the uh, towns, the uh, railways, uh, mines, etc., and the uh, poor women, <clears throat> and I use that word, <clears throat> excuse me, affectionately, would have to then live on the homestead with the, the, their, their children, typically young children, unfortunately, um, uh, and endure uh, isolation, loneliness uh, and a demand for hard work, uh, not only on, on the, the homestead, but also having to deal with their uh, children. So needless to say, it was not an easy sort of, uh, sort of a time for anybody. And one of the major difficulties was if you came later in the year, of course you could, did not have the chance of growing or putting in your own garden. So you had to then, or to, quickly build an acceptable sort of uh, um, um, shelter. So you had to find relatives or, or neighbors or friends, somebody that would put you up. So it's not uncommon to have a couple of families living in a simple sort of small 18 by 20 foot uh, log house and having to share food, cooking, etc. So it was not uh, a, a pleasant experience. And I think again, a lot of the women who were reluctant to uh, come out initially, the men were the more adventuresome types, um, uh, sort of were wondering why did we come out here when it was, you know, a hard life in the Ukraine, but at least we had the comfort and support of family and, and friends 
So the those who um, could come earlier on would build a, a simple um, bourdet or um, <clears throat> earthen hut that was nothing more than a dugout, at about a, a rectangular 10 by a, 20, a 14 foot dugout, about uh, two and a half to four feet uh, deep, and uh, then framed in a teepee style frame with saplings covered with slough grass and sod. Uh, they would have a probably, a, possibly a small sort of a window um, in the back end and either a wooden door or um, a cloth door, heavy cloth door in the front. A beautiful example is in the Ukrainian village. So if you go out there, you will see this and it's actually plastered on the outside with clay uh, so that uh, the rain doesn't get in. But so that's that was their accommodation. Uh, they would also quickly build um, or uh, dig up a small garden beside the, uh, the Bourdais and also, uh, if possible, start digging out a small, much less than an acre uh, uh, um, site for grain because grain flour was an important part of their diet. So they would have a very basic sort of uh, um, um, food supply. And that food supply would be things like potatoes, onions, cabbage, beans, cucumbers, and herbs. Now, remember, they brought seeds with them. That was one of the things that uh, the women were wise enough to recognize that they had to bring things with them because they did not know what was available to them. And for them, uh, that was a sort of um, a special effort that really was really uh, proven to be quite important. In, in addition to whatever they could raise, they then had the various uh, native plants that they could use that were edible, mushrooms, uh, berries, uh, and uh, wildlife, rabbits, etc. cetera. Um, they, would, uh, they didn't have uh, guns with them or rifles with them to uh, kill uh, larger game animals, but they would uh, trap uh, birds and so forth. So they had uh, catch fish and so forth. So they had a way of supplementing their uh, sort of uh, food supply. Unfortunately, um, the sort of uh, limited range of uh, food items, items available meant that in the early 1900s, the major health issues on homesteads were an insufficient and improper food supply. And malnutrition was a cause of death for 40 up to 40% of young children less than two years old. So it really affected them because needless to say, they didn't have a cow for milk and cream, et cetera. So the children had to do with tea, as an example, um, as best could be made uh, for them to have something to drink uh, after they were you know, off uh, mother's uh, breast milk. So, um, and the men had to leave. They basically had to go and start working to uh, get money so they could buy um, draft animals, oxen or horses, and also so they could uh, uh, get money to buy plows, etc. And the women now were left behind to not only work on the, the sort of uh, the um, shelters, to uh, dig the garden, to work on the um, um, small grain field. And they were lucky if they had older children, because those, of course, would have to help as well. So basically, when you were a child in that family, you started do working as soon as you were able to. And I remember one woman, when I asked her what the children play with, she just gave me this sort of look and said, what do you mean by that? We were working as soon as we were walking. Um, so the, um, the objective was to build a, um, a log house, which they could do in uh, you know, a few years. And um, that the logs came from uh, uh, clearing of their land or actually were brought in. The constructions of the uh, log houses were a uh, sort of neighborhood B, in a matter of speaking, everybody helped each other. So remember, all of them were pretty well in the same boat and needing to rely on their neighbors, but also to be relied upon by their neighbors as well. So it was always a sharing experience. Um, and they would build a one uh, a single story, one to two room, a sort of log home. The two room was more um, common. It would have a um, south facing exposure 
and um, a smaller room to the uh, west side, a larger room to the east side, and a hallway storage area in between. The um, living activities, uh, uh, sleeping, cooking, and so forth, were in the smaller room, by the way, and the larger room was uh, used for storing their various uh, items that they brought with them, um, clothing, uh, icons, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so that um, was a room that was used for guests and for grandparents, but was not used regularly by the family uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And uh, their uh, their sort of uh, lifestyle was simply one of basic survival. Now, it typically took about five years before the farming practices came um, changed from a subsistence type of, of lifestyle that they had experienced in the old country and were forced to experience here. And they could start developing a more economic commercial type of uh, farming enterprise where they had draft animals, um, equipment like um, plows and uh, uh, threshing machines, steam engines and so forth. So then they could move into a, a more productive farming practice where they could start selling their crops. And there was a high demand for grain, especially from Eastern Canada and so forth. So there was a lot of opportunity for that. Now, the native plants that they found that they could use were ones that um, they um, had found in the old country. And a major one was lamb's quarters or uh, goosefoot, which is an early spring um, weed, but uh, highly edible. And it was called Ukrainian uh, spinach because it tasted like spinach, could be prepared like spinach and so forth. And uh, typically, collected by the children and even cooked by the children because remember the mother was always doing something or other that needed that was uh, you know a priority in a matter of speaking so um, sometimes unfortunately the uh, and the uh, Ukrainians called uh, that particular plant natena or loboda now natena has also been used for something called pigweed which is an edible uh, weed as well, but the Ukrainians, as far as I can ascertain, never used it in the old country as such, and I think it was just simply a name that applied to um, uh, uh, lamb's quarters, because um, they, uh, later on, when they weeded their gardens, they would actually throw the, uh, the lamb's quarters to the uh, pigs. Remember that any plant when it's just uh, emerging and immature, has not developed bitter secondary uh, compounds, which were deterring uh, sort of uh, uh, grazing and, and herbivory. So basically when you use a, an immature plant, you could uh, easily eat it and, and, and with, with, with relish, in a matter of speaking, not with relish, uh, but with, with in, enjoying it. But the point was that as it became mature, then it was really inedible. So basically you were always focusing on uh, young uh, sort of plants. Dandelion was uh, widely used as well. Um, sorrel, which is, uh, they called kvasok, was also used um, and uh, nettles. Nettles had to be washed because they've got, they're, they're called stinging nettles for a reason. They have, um, they release um, formic acid when you touch them. So some people, of course, get a, a, a terrible rash. Other people can actually handle them quite easily, get no reaction, uh, but uh, they needed to be soaked in water and then they could be um, eaten and, and used uh, just like um, uh, the uh, loboda or uh, um, goosefoot was and, um, and prepared in, in the same way. They were really quite desirable because they're high in minerals, um, 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 uh, and vitamins and, and, and nutrients and so forth. And in fact, um, some families actually made sure that the children were given a regular sort of serving of it because of course it was more than healthy. Uh, they used uh, the rose, the, uh, the, the petals and the rose hips themselves, um, eating them either fresh or, or, or um, eating both actually fresh. The children would just simply chew on the outside and then spit out the uh, inner sort of, uh, fuzzy uh, seeds and uh, or make a tea of them or they could maybe be made into jams. Um, they also use something called cold's foot which uh, grows in sort of uh, wetter areas 
It's an interesting plant because it's got a green top, but when you turn it over, it's got a nice fuzzy whitish uh, bottom. And uh, that they could use actually for making cabbage rolls when they didn't have uh, cabbage available to them. So that, uh, and then they use things like yarrow, uh, burdock, sow thistle, cow parsnip, chickweed. And uh, needless to say, when food was scarce, the early, during the early homestead period, people tried and ate any plant that was not bitter because it was a survival food. Um, one interesting crop that they, that they came across was uh, Seneca um, uh, plant and they would dig up Seneca root because they could sell it. Uh, and uh, initially, uh, and they could sell it, uh, digging it up, uh, washing it, drying it uh, at the uh, local store or trade it in for uh, required uh, sort of uh, household needs. And uh, it grew in open woodland and um, it had medicinal properties that, that of course uh, were, um, it was purchased by uh, various pharmaceutical companies for further processing. But initially uh, it um, was being sold for about 15 to 20 cents a uh, dry pound. And uh, later on, it was up to 65 cents a pound because it was becoming uh, much uh, scarcer. And uh, in a good day of picking, you could easily pick 10 pounds worth of uh, Seneca root. Unfortunately, uh, needless to say, with that intensive sort of uh, harvesting, um, it certainly compromised the indigenous peoples who used it again for their own um, sort of remedies. And they soon blamed the Ukrainians, uh, rightly so, for harvesting the uh, crop beyond uh, reason. And uh, whereas the uh, indigenous peoples harvested as they needed it, and always respected the fact that they had to leave behind enough to keep the sort of uh, uh, population growing. With respect to uh, berries, um, the berries were abundant and uh, uh, a sort of uh, large uh, berries uh, uh, crops. Um, and uh, as the land was uh, cultivated, as the animals were allowed to uh, graze in the woodlands, whatever else, that changed dramatically that the uh, sort of abundance of uh, berries was no longer um, as um, available. They typically uh, would use strawberries, raspberries, Saskatoon, blueberry, and high and bush and low bush cranberry. And I'll talk about that a little later on. Choke cherries and pin cherries, uh, gooseberry uh, and currants were less used. Um, and I will refer to that a little later on. Uh, the uh, primary berry pickers were children. Uh, they had two uh, sort of uh, times when they really did that actively, when they took the cows out and brought them back from pasture, and, and when they uh, went to school and came back from school. And needless to say, as they picked, they ate. So again, there was a nice uh, nutritious sort of a supplement to their sort of uh, meager diet. Um, needless to say, the parents were too busy to pick. Although they did have Sundays when they would get together with friends and family and go out and have kind of a picnic like uh, um, day and pig berries and, and uh, mushrooms and whatever else was uh, was available. Now the um, uh, surplus berries could also be sold in the stores uh, or traded it in so sold or traded in at the store that was always a, a possibility and also they could uh, um, trade berry or sell berries and uh, jams that they had made from those berries in to town folk. So there was always some sense of being able to uh, make some money. Uh, canning uh, initially was uh, limited and the word canning was not quite appropriate because when we think of canning, we think of metal cans, but really we, we should be really using the word jarring, although that doesn't make sense. Uh, jars were already uh, invented and available in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but were not widely available and were costly. So basically the um, Ukrainians, when they um, canned uh, fruit, they simply uh, cooked the berries and put, uh, and put them into bottles, uh, beer bottles or so forth, or any kind of a, 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 a pot-like container they would have. They could then put paper over it and seal it with wax. But of course, it couldn't be stored for too long. So basically, whatever you can had to be used up very quickly. Later on, of course, when they talked about canning, 
uh, fruits and vegetables, they actually were using the um, glass uh, sort of uh, uh, jars, the so-called sloiki that, that they would, uh, would talk about. Uh, the berries were used for um, uh, fresh, of course, whenever uh, possible. And then they were, would be uh, in so-called canned, uh, made into jams, juices, syrups, and dried. And even some were frozen, and that was the uh, sort of cranberry. So um, the uh, low bush cranberry, interestingly enough, is not a cranberry. It's not the true cranberry. It uh, belongs to the sort of uh, heather um, heath family, low growing um, shrub um, with single berries, really hard to, to pick. The one that we commonly refer to as the cranberry is the high bush cranberry. And it is the true sort of, um, uh, uh, well, it's not the true cranberry because the low bush cranberry is the true one, but, and uh, it's easier to pick. The uh, berries are in clusters, whatever else. And so some of you may have uh, recognized that the term Kalena country has been used for the sort of Ukrainian block settlements in uh, sort of Alberta. And uh, the, um, it was a very healthy um, berry and also had medicinal properties. And it was one berry that could actually be picked um, early before it matured and um, dried out and rehydrated later, right, later on when they needed it. Could also be frozen. So that was another sort of way of, of uh, using it. Um, pin cherries and choke cherries were uh, not highly desirable. Of course, they had a, a sort of a, a bitter, um, bitter uh, taste um, and uh, they had pits in them. The pits uh, are cyanogenic, but that's irrelevant in the sense that uh, they were just a, a nuisance to, to, to uh, get rid of. So you didn't have direct access. You just couldn't eat them uh, sort of fresh. Um, and what they also did uh, in no time, they had they, rhubarb was ubiquitous. It, they always had it growing, it was perennial. And of course, it has a more sort of a tart like a flavor, a more, um, when I use the word uh, tart, I'm talking about uh, um, an acidic kind of, of uh, flavor because it's a salic acid in it. So that's why you can't eat the um, sort of leaves. And they would mix it with the uh, sweet um, uh, berries, strawberries, raspberries, and so forth, because they didn't have to add sugar anymore. Otherwise, they would have to have had bought sugar to uh, use with the uh, rhubarb, etc. Another um, plant that they used was um, the uh, hazelnut. They collected the hazelnut. The, the children, especially, they would uh, dry them and then husk them and then uh, save them for uh, Christmas treats. So the children at Christmas would. would uh... Mushrooms, uh, they had about um, six or seven types that they um, harvested. The, the thing about picking mushrooms, uh, you have to be very cautious. And the three rules I'll share with you. All mushrooms are edible once. The second time you're dead already with the poisonous ones. Um, there are bold mushroom pickers and there are old mushroom pickers, but there are no old and bold mushroom pickers. So again, caution is, is desirable. And the third point, when in doubt, throw it out. So you had to really know what you were doing. And the uh, grandparents, uh, the mothers especially, knew which ones were edible. Uh, they um, um, used red tops, uh, shaggy manes, puffballs, uh, meadow field mushrooms, very much like the one that we buy in a store as the sort of typical uh, white uh, mushroom. Morels, um, the chanterelles, uh, honey mushroom was especially important because it grew on stumps in the deciduous uh, sort of forest. Uh, they dried it and used it for the Christmas sort of 12 uh, uh, dish uh, supper. Everybody picked mushrooms. So it was a uh, sort of in incidental activity, not an intentional activity per se. And uh, then the mother or grandmother would go through and uh, sort of select what was uh, usable. They used it, as I said, primarily uh, fresh uh, as they found it. There was one poisonous one that they used, and that was the uh, fly agaric or uh, death angel. It's a larger mushroom, uh, green, uh, orangey to sort of top to it with little sort of white uh, wart-like structures, a little bulb at the bottom, deadly poison, uh, poisonous to humans. And they used it for killing flies. They would chop it up, 
put it in with some milk on a on a plate and keep it on the wind seal uh, on the uh, um, window sill and of course the flies would come down and, and would die with, uh, from it. Unfortunately, if they had a cat and the cat got into that, it was dead as well. Um, and that plate was kept isolated so nobody used it for any kind of other food, uh, for uh, food applications. The gardens themselves um, were uh, met all of, so the criteria of a good garden, um, it would have to be a level location, good drainage and circulation at least six or more hours of um, daylight and a, a good rich uh, and loose soil, which you would find under the sort of uh, uh, the, um, um, the uh, forested uh, areas so that that was what they were able to sort of uh, uh, quickly sort of uh, utilize for their needs. Uh, typically the garden sites were um, closer to the edge of the uh, grain field. The early uh, garden um, had the old country style in a sense of rectangular plots, six uh, by three to six by four foot in size and about six to eight inches in, uh, in height. And um, they were usually single crop plots. So you just put one plot, plot in a, in a uh, one crop in a plot, and then you could rotate them easily as well. In time, they recognized that uh, the more English model was to use rows, uh, whether flat or, or raised rows. And those um, sort of gardens were more decorative and uh, more organized. So they started adapting that as well. Um, the um, Initial crops that they, they raised, uh, let me see where I have my uh, information here. Um, um, oh, let's just get back to the, to the plots. The plots typically had these sort of uh, broad leafed and uh, spreading growth uh, type of, of uh, vegetables. Uh, this uh, reduced the weed growth, which, which was uh, you know, a, a, a job that had to be uh, worked on and enhanced the moisture retention. So things like cabbage, uh, potatoes, cucumbers, etc., cetera, um, uh, were grown, typically grown in plots. The rows were typically used for uh, narrow um, leaf crops, uh, such as carrots and beans and peas, etc. Herbs and, and flowers were typically grown in later gardens. Again, um, flowers especially were decorative and, and, and beautiful and so forth, but they required work and they had no food values so that they were again an inconvenience. So the, uh, the early sort of gardens, um, as soon as they got animals had to be sort of uh, fenced in um, and um, typically were closer to the house. A small garden was close, a fenced garden was close to the house. And uh, later on, they would also add a larger garden uh, unfenced garden uh, down by the um, sort of uh, grain field because by then the family was growing and the need was there, but also the labor sort of force was there as well. Uh, they would by then have the um, various animals uh, in corrals, in pig pens, in chicken coops and so forth. So the animals were more uh, controlled. Uh, the fences themselves that they made around the um, the gardens were again old, old country, <clears throat> excuse me, old country style um, willow fences, either woven diagonally or in uh, sort of picket uh, fashion, and uh, they were more effect, mostly effective because at times the, the chickens and ducks and geese could get around, uh, wander around the uh, sort of uh, farmyards, um, and also. Uh, that would keep out rabbits, etc. So uh, they serve the uh, purpose. The husbands dug up the gardens in the uh, spring for the woman, but she had to then, uh, for the wife, and then she had to sort of break up the clods, um, uh, seed it and uh, weed it and harvest it, whatever else. So then during the rest of the uh, growing season, that was her job plus the work of children, especially when it came to weeding, children were, were involved. You have to remember that gardening was not a hobby as most of us look at it now, but an essential survival activity that required constant hard work. The uh, crops uh, initially um, were only vegetables, as I mentioned, and uh, later on herbs and uh, 
flowers possibly added. Uh, they brought heirloom seeds with them. What I mean by that is seeds that they had passed on from one generation to another and so forth. But these were unfortunately adapted to these growing uh, conditions in the old country. And in uh, Canada, they, they uh, typically were unsuitable. Uh, we had early frosts, we had uh, early uh, or late uh, or early uh, sort of snowfall and so forth, so that they were risky uh, to use, but they nevertheless had to uh, use whatever they had available to them at that time. Later on, uh, they could uh, get um, seeds from neighbors and so forth. They, uh, peddlers came by to sell seeds and they actually could actually um, uh, order seeds from uh, Eaton's catalog, uh, et cetera, so that they diversified their crops greatly. Uh, so initially the crops were basically um, potatoes, cabbage, onion, and garlic, extended shortly after to include beets, cucumbers, beans, and peas. Uh, turnips and corn. And then later on, when they had fully established their homestead, um, had large gardens, etc., they could have a variety of things like carrots, tomatoes, lettuce, um, um, Swiss chard, etc. So all kinds of other things. Two interesting crops that they grew were um, poppy, the opium poppy, and hemp. Uh, the hemp that they grew was more of the fibrous variety, and I'll talk about both of them uh, shortly. But uh, the opium poppy, they grew um, simply for seeds that they then um, extracted oil from. So it was uh, uh, an oil producing uh, plant. And um, unfortunately, they recognized that it could be used for folk uh, medicine. Uh, they used it uh, to create a kind of a sedative with uh, uh, dissolving the, um, the green opium poppies uh, pods in uh, uh, alcohol, and it was kind of a sedative. Uh, but a more tragic uh, use of it was taking green poppies, mashing them up with a bit of sugar, and using them as a soother for babies. Um, and that could knock out a baby easily for uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, while the mother had to work in a field. So not desirable, not recommended, but in many cases, cases an, act, an act of desperation because uh, it would not kill the child directly, but it would um, dull its mental capacities. And, and uh, I remember a sad story where a woman you know, was crying because she, uh, she could not believe what she had done to her uh, children, uh, but she said, I had to. I had no other choice. Uh, so, uh, and uh, hemp was initially grown for uh, fiber, but then later on, of course, um, they, they uh, found that there was no need for that. They could buy fabric uh, cheaply. And so it was grown again for um, its oil content. Um, the uh, seeds were um, extremely sort of uh, um, desirable for the oil that they produced and it was a green oil, very tasty oil that was, as my mother would say, you know, uh, uncomparable to any other sort of vegetable oil that you can imagine. Uh, the, the point is that they did not use the hemp or the um, poppy for um, psychoactive recreational purposes. It was not a drug per se. They knew of, of its properties, but they did not use it in that application. By the 1930s, late 30s, uh, the Canadian government had produced the Opium and Narcotic Drug Act. So uh, in that time, the Ukrainians found that they were getting their gardens raided by city folks looking for those two crops. And the RCMP were making visits to ensure that those crops were not being grown. The uh, Gardening practices, again, the women were the uh, gardeners and caretakers of the food supply. Um, they um, um, had to adjust their sort of gardening practices because in the old country, they actually planted their gardens anywhere from March to April. And those of you who may have tried that before uh, recognize that that's a no-no. Uh, and then they would start harvesting them in uh, early July. Now in Canada, you could not plant until late May at best, uh, 
and uh, then you would have to sort of harvest somewhere in the August to October period. So they had to totally adjust to the sort of growing conditions here. Um, they, uh, as I said, had a garden close to the house, I think, which was uh, providing more of the uh, vegetables that they would use on a daily basis in, in their sort of uh, 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 meals. And then the uh, uh, larger gardens growing closer to the fields were the ones that had uh, crops that matured later on and uh, were more uh, suited for being stored uh, over uh, winter. Um, they, um, women, when they started uh, their uh, seedlings early on, they either use cold um, frames or hotbeds. Cold frames, you're simply uh, putting soil into a frame, um, having a kind of a wall behind it so the sun reflects into it and the sun heats it up. And uh, then, of course, the seedlings uh, start growing well, but they're still sort of uh, acclimatized to the uh, sort of outside conditions, covered in the evening with a cloth or, or so forth to keep them to retain the heat. The, uh, the um, hotbed uh, had um, manure added to the soil and the decomposition warmed up the soil as well. So you had both the sun and the sort of uh, warming of the decomposition. Um, they actually also, also some of them enhanced the uh, seedling sort of um, growth and disease, uh, disease, uh, disease resistance by using something called willow water. They would um, gather green willow twigs with leaves or without in the spring, cut them into uh, about 25 to 30 centimeter lengths, uh, place them in buckets of rainwater for uh, uh, around two days or so, and then they would water the seedlings and found that it actually enhanced the seedling sort of uh, growth and strengthen the uh, seedling. So uh, if you look at the uh, literature or uh, go on the internet, you'll find that you can actually use aspirins in the same way as well. Um, they also uh, enriched their soils and protected their plants in certain ways. They uh, scattered eggshells on their gardens, crumpled up eggshells uh, for enriching the uh, sort of uh, soil with uh, calcium and also for offsetting the um, acidity of the soil because if they use manure, manure is acidic. Uh, house ashes were also spread on the ground to add uh, minerals to the soil and actually uh, showed uh, that the crops could be enhanced in their sort of growth and ripening by doing that. They watered their garden with uh, laundry um, water, which had lye in it, a uh, lye soap residue, and that controlled uh, various um, garden maggots. They um, had natural pesticides, uh, wood ash was one of them. Uh, it was corrosive to insects. Um, they sprinkle lye soap flakes around the garden to keep the deer and rodents away, so something to consider. Uh, and they also used um, ashes on cabbage to uh, keep uh, cabbage flies away. Uh, soapy dishwater and tobacco water, meaning tobacco leaves soaked in, in water, was used also as a garden insecticide. They practiced companion planting uh, because they recognized that uh, plants could actually protect certain crops from uh, um, pests, uh, such as marigold, uh, and others could actually attract pollinators so that the companion plants worked in two ways, protection as well as attraction. Um, the uh, best fertilizer was the uh, sort of uh, green garden um, plant waste from weeding, et cetera, or harvesting the uh, sort of uh, plants. and. Uh, they uh, had to harvest up wheat about two or three times a year, and that was a major backbreaking job. But needless to say, the children were involved in that role. The um, manure was used as well, but as I said, it required a uh, longer sort of a period to decompose, up to two years. It was put in the on the fields in the spring and fall, but in the gardens only in the sort of spring. Uh, fall and then work in on the spring. So um, women actually loved uh, working in the garden uh, and they would get up there and, and work in the garden before uh, breakfast and then uh, later on in the day when they had extra time, but it was something that they really found an attraction to. And for a woman, uh, planting a, a large garden was like having a large family. 
uh, you plant it, you nourish it, you watch it grow and mature, and then you harvest it. The harvest is in the grandchildren, remember that. Uh, so next, uh, the garden harvest, they um, always try to plant enough to carry them over the winter. It was critical that they had a winter food supply because there was, they had no financial resources to go out and buy things at the store, etc. other than the basic minimums of, of uh, salt, uh, sugar, um, uh, kerosene, etc. And uh, later on, of course, the large numerous gardens allowed that. Uh, they um, also would uh, share with neighbors and, 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 and friends, etc. So sharing was not only generosity, but a reciprocal activity, meaning if I share with you, I expect you to share with me. Um, the fall was a busy time, of course, harvesting the garden and grain field, preparing the crops for storage and canning uh, fruits and jams, etc. During that time period, uh, typically children stayed home from school. It was recognized that they needed to be a part of the workforce and uh, that uh, was uh, permissible. Um, the, um, at that time, they would harvest the, uh, the uh, poppy and uh, hemp for um, oil processing, which meant that they would uh, collect the seeds. They would uh, <clears throat> warm them in water, bind them in a sort of a wool fabric and then press them and to extract the, uh, the, the uh, sort of oil. So out of 60 pounds of hemp seed, you could get about two gallons of, of wonderful sort of uh, hemp oil. Um, the uh, seed cakes from both the um, um, poppy, uh, or for, from the uh, hemp and uh, sunflower that they also could be fed to the animals, but the poppy cakes uh, residue could be actually eaten by uh, uh, the uh, family. They also grew uh, flax uh, early on for, uh, for oil as well, but that was of limited use. Peas and, and beans were left in the pods to uh, mature and dry before picking, and then they were shelled. Corn was left to dry in the husk and then shelled, and um, these then could be further dried if necessary in the peach. The peach was an outside large uh, sort of oven that they used and after they finished uh, with the uh, baking their bread because they would break bread uh, two or three times a, a week uh, and uh, you know half a dozen to a dozen uh, loaves at a time bread flour was a big uh, part of their diet um, they then uh, kept all of their uh, sort of dried uh, harvest seeds peas beans berries mushrooms etc in either that hallway storage area between the two rooms or up in the attic. More so in the attic because again that was an area that was nice and dry and uh, warm. Uh, potatoes, uh, carrots, parsnips and, and the root crops were typically uh, initially stored in uh, root um, cellars which were the old abandoned uh, sort of uh, um, bourdes if they had them or they would dig out and, and make a root cellar and then later on they actually dug a cellar under um, one of the rooms and I think it was the big room which would have had a wooden floor and they could then uh, not only store their foods there but also their uh, various uh, canned goods. Um, cabbage and sauerkraut. Um, cabbage uh, was made into sauerkraut and uh, cucumbers were made into pickles and those were the two major winter vegetables that really prevented scurvy and they made those in barrels. Uh, the um, the uh, sauerkraut could actually also be frozen and then chipped out as necessary. The pickles, of course, were, were, were kept unfrozen. And those were again stored in the uh, sort of cellar and used accordingly. Uh, at the end of the uh, growing season, if they, um, or at the uh, end of the winter, uh, if they had leftover uh, sauerkraut, then they would just feed it to the, uh, to the pigs and so forth. Um, but those were uh, really important sort of uh, uh, supplementary sort of uh, uh, foods processed accordingly. And uh, the ideal family of four would need the following to be carried over winter uh, uh, comfortably. Two to three bushels of uh, carrots, uh, 30 heads of cabbage, 30 to 40 squash or pumpkins, six to 14 bushels of potatoes, one to two bushels of onions, one to two bushels of potato, uh, beets, and two to three 
barrels of sauerkraut and one to two barrels of, cuca uh, of pickles. Um, each bushel, by the way, is about uh, 40 to 50 pounds in, in weight. So you could see that they required a large amount of, of food to be stored. A growing family also needed to extend the size and, and uh, number of its gardens. So there was never a problem with that because the extended family meant that there were more workers available in time as well. So I think, I think my time has pretty well run up and you probably your attention span has also been exhausted. I hope that some of the things I've shared with you may bring back memories from your own experiences with your grandparents. Um, even if they were in, in, in a, different, a di different ethnic sort of uh, grouping uh, or from your own uh, sort of personal experiences, enjoying gardening and so forth. I myself do not have a garden. Um, that I found was uh, work and uh, did not give me any personal pleasure because I could go to the farmer's market and uh, easily purchase uh, beautifully washed, grown uh, vegetables and, and fruits, etc. So I turned to that and, and, and uh, uh, have no uh, regrets. And in uh, my uh, sort of, I live in a little cul-de-sac with uh, a laneless lots. Uh, there's only one garden amongst uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, houses. So you can see that we may change that, you know, in the near future, but gardens are not something that we uh, sort of uh, indulge in ourselves or very few people do. And we certainly promote the use of local sort of market gardeners and saying, please, as much as possible, buy locally. So you're supporting those sort of producers as well. So thank you for your time, for your attention, um, for, uh, for hopefully learning something. And remember, go to the Ukrainian village. Um, and as you go through it, experience it, hopefully remembering some of the things that I, I uh, talked about or, or described, whatever else, because you'll certainly see them. And when you talk to the, to, the, uh, to the workers there, they will speak to you as if you are a guest and they are the sort of uh, residents of those uh, places. So if there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them. It looks like we have three questions in the chat. So I think these are from um, a little bit previously in the presentation. Um, so we have one from Kay Barron and she asked, was that 40% malnutrition in Alberta generally or just among Ukrainians? I, th I, think, it was, I think it was in the Ukrainian sort of uh, block settlements because the government was aware. I should also say to you, the government provided no financial or other support to the Ukrainians. That was something I think that were given to some of the earlier different immigrant groups. But once the large numbers came into Canada, there was no provision of any financial support at all. And so therefore that's where the block settlements became so important because they had each other and they, they, they knew they could rely on each other. Yes. Wow. Um, we also have a question here from Katie and she says, um, what did marigolds prevent? Uh, they, they just kept uh, the uh, the uh, insect pests away. They're, they're sort of, uh, the marigolds and any fragrant, um, you know, uh, plant will do that. So tansy mustards and so forth, uh, et cetera. There are a number of plants that, that will exude a fragrance that uh, keeps the bugs away. So marigolds are, are, are well known for that. Oh, fantastic. All right, and we have... Let's see a question here from Tara. Uh, how did they water their gardens? Did they just rely on rainwater? I think rainwater was, was their main source. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the way they garden in such a way, there was a good moisture retention because uh, between the plots and so forth, the, the water would, uh, would gather and, and, and uh, enter the soil so that rainwater would have been the main sort of, and then they would have just used uh, buckets and so forth, pails. Perfect. And I think we have one more question. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to either put them in the chat or you can um, unmute your mic and um, speak. But we have a question here from LJ. Uh, where can we find more detailed information about foraging mushrooms, plants, and berries in Alberta in the way that Ukrainian Canadians did? 
There is a, uh, you won't find that directly, unfortunately. There is a site um, that if you look at edible plants in uh, Alberta, it'll give you a detailed list of all the berries, mushrooms, and wild plants that are edible. And uh, excuse me for a second. Let me just see if I can find, I, I don't have it with me, but if you look up that, you'll find in the list of, of uh, citations, one that will be just for Alberta and it'll nicely, so you can actually uh, identify the, the plant and then when you click on it, it'll bring up all of the features for it. So yeah, so, you, so that it's, it's uh, an available sort of uh, site. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, no, I think that was it. It was um, detailed information about foraging mushrooms, plants, and berries. Uh, no, so so uh, again, I caution you about the mushrooms. It's a it's a serious sort of issue that there are three groups of mushrooms: the edible, the semi-edible, and the uh, sort of unedible, the poisonous ones. The uh, the uh, Semi-edible ones may not kill you, but they'll give you stomach upsets and so forth. So the point is that there are some, and some of us definitely, you know, have food intolerances or whatever else. So the ones that you really want to know are the ones that are edible and restrict yourselves to the very few. Don't get adventurous because if you don't know it, like I said, if in doubt, throw it out. And uh, there are the you know often we'll find after the uh, sort of uh, um, uh, rain they'll come out in in, in the, sort of the grasslands nice big white mushrooms now those are edible uh, etc once they they reach a certain point uh, they use as I said puff balls uh, but once they reach the sporulating stage of course they're not edible anymore or the shaggy mane is not edible at a later stage so earlier on they're fine but later on they're not and as I said if you don't know just just Buy, buy them at the, in the store and, and stay safe. Definitely. All right, it looks like we have one more, one last question here in the chat. Um, were berries grown in the gardens or were they foraged from wild plants around the homesteads? Initially, they were definitely foraged from uh, ar around because they were so abundant and there was so much of the natural landscape. Once that was cut back, they recognized that uh, the two major berries that they relied on uh, uh, or used were the strawberries and the raspberries and they were then able to get cultivated varieties that they grow and so I, in my own yard I have a nice big patch of, of raspberries uh, easy to grow you just sort of uh, um, cut them back uh, or cut off the uh, dead uh, sort of uh, stems in in the spring and then the, the new shoots will come up and and uh, bear fruit so yeah uh, and also the berries were not only as infrequent in occurrence, but also much smaller in size. So they were over harvested in matter of speaking. Fantastic, I know I have a strawberry plant in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, we have another question in the chat here. Uh, Tara wants to know, uh, sunflowers were grown in the old country and seemed abundant. Were they grown mainly for oil production or as flowers? Uh, I think they were grown, f they were grow they were, an attractive flower, yes, but also they would grow um, sunflowers and hemp as um, sort of windbreaks, uh, typically around uh, the hemp around the edge of the uh, garden and uh, typically um, in the larger gardens along the edge of the field so that the uh, sunflowers and, and uh, especially the sunflowers would uh, uh, break the uh, sort of act as a, as a windbreak and they did use them for, uh, for oil. Uh, but not as much initially because oil, um, poppies and uh, hemp were the two major oil plants. Uh, the uh, sunflower never came out as important. And yet in the Ukraine nowadays, uh, sunflowers, if you, if you ever uh, visit that country, uh, are, 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 are in large crops and are a major sort of uh, agricultural product. Perfect. All right. I think that is our last question in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Let me just thank everybody for coming. And the reason I thank you is that when I sh um, interviewed my informants, I suggested to them that the only way I could thank them is by sharing what they shared with me. And so now you've allowed me to meet that sort of obligation that what they shared with me so graciously and, and openly, and especially women. Uh, I found that the women, once I started getting them talking, I couldn't turn them off. Uh, so uh, 
sometimes my interviews went well beyond the one hour and uh, or two and up to two hours the men would always say well what do you, I, I don't know anything or who cares or who who needs to know that or whatever else but the women were never sort of like that and i really have a deep appreciation for women as to what they contribute to families and how willing they are to share so when you have women get together they truly share meaningful information men get together and talk about the latest uh, game or or the weather something that really nobody needs uh, to to uh, or gets anything from so ladies uh, you really make a contribution to society and to uh, families Thank you, Michael, so much for this lecture. We do have, uh, I don't know if you can see the chat, but we do have everybody in the chat is thanking you and saying it was a fascinating lecture. My pleasure. There's a Ukrainian term I want to use as well, which means for what? You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's nothing that, I, that I've sacrificed to give you. I've just passed something on. So remember that word, which means for what? And when somebody does something, says, thanks you for something, reply, for what? You know, challenge them to say, you know, how have I changed your life other than sort of enjoying your company and sharing something with you? And th I, I say that to you, Sush Joy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.